Nick, remember to record your screen. I uh, just press the button. Okay, great. And I'm going to mute myself now. Cool. It's a very good afternoon to each one of us. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming. My name is Gracious uh, Jifamuna, and I will be your host for this afternoon. I am so much excited. I am looking forward to our time together. And before I go further, I would love to commit our time into the hands of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to gather from different places. We thank you for the gift of life and we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to connect. And I want to commit our panelists who are going to share with us insights with regards to parenting, that you use each one of them. I also want to thank you for each and every participant that will be able to learn from you as we are using the panelists to teach us this afternoon. Bless us, Lord Jesus, and I pray even for our connection that we will not have any challenges. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. Yes, as I said, personally, I am super, super excited. I'm looking forward to learning because one thing that I take for serious as a parent is I desire to raise a generation of leaders, my kids, who fear nothing except God. And I know that I can't do it on my own and I have to tap wisdom from others who have done it before, some experts. And today we are honored and privileged to have amazing panelists among us. So thank you so much once more. I serve with an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. Allow me to share a little bit about Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, as an organization, our mandate is to help fulfill the Great Commission as was given by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. And one thing that amazes me, especially during the season, is the fact that the Lord has opened the borders. Some places where we could have not been able to go because of internet, we are able now to reach it out. So you don't need a visa, you don't need um, an e-ticket, you don't need an accommodation, you just need your heart and internet, and boom, you are going out to reach out to the nation. And I love the fact that as an organization, we understand that we cannot do it on our own, hence we seek Partnership, partnership with people, with individuals, with organizations, and above all with churches. And as we do this, as we decide that someone will come to Jesus as God and Savior. And today, and that's very webinar, I'm honored uh, as you asked to have a panelist who has his own consulting firm with regards to parenting. She loves parenting a lot. She does workshops to parents and even to youth. And yes, today we have a dear sister and the Lord, my friend. I think our friendship is growing and also a fellow Toastmaster. So she will introduce to us who she is, what she does, and she will talk about the whole idea of raising the youth. But before I hand it over to him, Allow me to say, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. And after the session, we're going to have a time of engagement. Our panelists will look at the questions and they will try to answer those questions. So please feel free to drop your questions or comments in the chat box. Then secondly, towards the end of our webinar, I want to introduce to us, in case you are here, uh, and you do not know Jesus, I'll give uh, an, a, just a short presentation on how you can become 
a Christian, a believer, because I believe this is very key. And also, secondly, I would love to introduce to us a platform that we have as Campus Crusade for Christ that can help you if you are a believer, you are stuck in this a season where you don't know how to reach out, how to disciple. We do have an amazing platform that can help you do evangelism and discipleship. So yes, stick around, don't go, grab your cup of coffee, and let's enjoy this webinar as we talk more on parenting. So yes, over to you, my dear friend, Karin Jordan. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Gracia, so much. And thank you, Campus Crusade, for inviting me to be a part of this afternoon session. And I've been so excited all day. Uh, Gracious and I were in our Toastmasters meeting together this morning and I, I could see she was already uh, on the ball for the day. <clears throat> and I, I must tell you, uh, this is now the subject that's so close to my heart. So everything about parenting and especially parenting of teens. And I want to kick off right away and bring you into the picture so that you don't uh, start wondering why am I speaking to you about. And yes, I am. I'm a single mom and I have a teenager uh, who is very, um, very quickly growing into um, a young adult. And I'm going to share my screen with you in a second and, and show you a, a photo or two of her so that you know why I'm so excited because God has given me a very special child to raise. And in that process, as he always does, he gives us as parents someone who will also grow us because the parenting process is definitely a journey of growth, as I'm sure you all know. And in his wisdom, God knows exactly who to place together. So I'm going to share my screen and I just want to make sure that everyone can see it. Gracious, you can just confirm. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. What I would like to ask is if you are watching now and you are able to see uh, the, the line should be around here, you can actually drag the gallery view to the right so that this screen share is larger and easier for you to see or it can be at the top so is everyone comfortable then i can just move this out of the way there we go my short story is that i'm living with a purpose but i'm living my purpose and oh does that feel good and I am filled with contentment. Does that mean that my life is easy? No, I have challenges every day and I need to find answers, but I am a really content person because I have found my purpose and I'm living it. And I grow people and I grow relationships between people. So that is my focus and the reason why I want to speak to you today is to grow you as a parent as well or show you how that can be done. I just want to go out. Give me a second. I see that one isn't moving along. So let's share the other one and try and uh, begin it again. You can be patient with me for a second. It's lovely how we test things and then it doesn't work. Let's see, there we go. All right. If I introduce myself to you, I do that to say I'm an effective parent leader because the concept of leadership and parenthood can't be set apart. And I'm going to take you on a little journey to show you how. I'm going to show you that uh, there is something called a Tall Trees Parenting Temperament Profile. And in that, for me as a parent, this is what my profile looks like. In terms of how I discipline, I'm a palm rose. The reason why you see these 
tree type names is because we use four different tree types to indicate temperament. And in our way of showing parents what their temperament is, we focus on how to discipline, how to nurture, and how to mentor. We want you to be able to see how your kids see you. It's like holding up a mirror, but it's a safe mirror. And in doing so, it helps me as a parent to see how my child sees me, experiences me, hears me, and how they feel about what they are seeing. It's very difficult to find another tool in life that can do that. And as you can see here, my focus is Generation Z and the parents of Generation Z at this moment fall mostly into Generation X where I am. The reason why I'm so passionate about Generation Z is because at this very moment we are raising them to become future parents, future leaders, and they will have to stand their place in society. And we are the ones with the power as parents to help and equip them to make a difference. So a short background, this is a photo, a photo album shot of myself and my daughter. I would like you to see the bond of love. The fact that to me it is an absolute joy to be a parent and as a teenager I decided that I would never be a parent because I believed I would never be good enough to be a parent because of my own experiences and we have a lot of fun and instead of seeing a teenager and a mom who's fighting this is the kind of thing you see and it's truly the kind of relationship that we have and this is where it all started when she was this gorgeous little baby and I was a happy mom. And this is my daughter today. She is a violinist and she's 19 years old. She's studying at University of Pretoria, studying music and psychology. And the way that she's been gifted, she wants to do her masters as a music therapist, which means she'll be helping other people and raising other people in terms of their leadership. What I want you to know is that God has a family photo album, just the way that we have photo albums. And we are in it. And here is an example of a photo album page. And you and I are on that. And so are our kids. And this is an example of one person. Can you imagine how many photos there are in God's photo album of us? Because he loves us as a father. I've used this example of Emily and in this little shot you can see her as a teenager. Here you can see her in love and God is enjoying every moment of her life as th that he created for her and her for. Okay and here we can see um, a typical uh, anger outburst moment. We can all identify with her feeling sick and right here this is Emily as a parent with her kids pushing all her buttons and she's feeling quite desperate and this is us the parents of the young leaders so today i'm speaking to you about raising young leaders raising future parents and raising future generations there's no way that i can raise my child and not affect the future generations that follow her and sometimes we think of our grandchildren that will come after our children. We might go as far as thinking about the great-grandchildren, but that's not where it stops. Every single generation after ours will be affected by the way that we parent. The saying goes that tall trees catch the most wind. It is true. Leadership always comes with challenges and opposition. What is leadership in terms of our talk today? It's parenting. And it also comes with challenges. Look at this little tree. There he is. He might be quite old, we don't know, because he's a little stunted. Instead of growing up, he was growing sideways. But he needed encouragement, he needed guidance. And if he had had that in the right way, he would have grown high up like this one, a tall, tall tree that can give shade to others. So diving into the whole issue of parenting, Here's your question. What do your teenagers see? What do they see between you as parents? 
Are you falling into this category or are you falling into that one? Sometimes it's a bit of both. The important thing to me is to teach parents that we are the bridge. One day, somewhere in all the years, those short few years of 18, 19, maybe 20 years that your child is with you, you need to realize that you are the bridge between their past and their future. And this is how we break it down. We look at the word balance, and balance is the way we live. We exemplify some sort of set of moral values and work ethics and relationship values. And we show our children how to have balance between work and time for ourselves, time for family, time for God. And maybe that balance is a bit out, but then there's help. We can also always bring everything back into balance, but just know that they need to see how to do it. And they look at us. The next thing in the bridge is R for resilience, is what we need to be able to, to send our kids out in the world with, is, is resilience emotionally. And sometimes we don't ourselves have much resilience. If we look at the recent situation um, that has been caused by COVID and all the destruction in relationships and, and economics, we see that parents are committing suicide. And the tragedy of it is that their resilience came to an end. And there are reasons for that. And we need to build our children's resilience so that they can stand stronger. And then influence. Influence is firstly our influence as a parent in our child's life. That is the greatest privilege. And we need to become more aware of what it actually means to have influence as a parent and how we impact our child's life. And looking at that, how do you measure it? And that's what I want to tell you about today is that we are able to measure certain things about our parenting and it helps us. And then the drum roll, you need to be a cheerleader for your child because the world out there is judging them. And if they have a cheerleader at home who can have the drum roll going for whatever they do, the small little achievements and the big ones, that will set them up for success in life. And then gear. Gear simply means that I need to gear my, my child with more than education. Education comes last, not because it's least important, but because education is a set a, a, a set um, uh, style or a set a program that exists with an institution or with an organization as a school or as a university or, or a college but we don't design that we simply move our child into that and enable them for education but we need to gear them for life we need to gear them emotionally psychologically, and especially gear them for leadership. So that's the bridge. And now we talk about those things that uh, help us to, to prevent the statistics. I don't want to see my child becoming a statistic of anything that's negative. And I know neither do you. So we look at misconceptions like this one. People say to me, parents say to me, my teens are raised well and they won't be tempted by peer pressure. I can tell you that teens are impressionable. They are subject to peer pressure, no matter how strong they are. Something somewhere can trigger your child. They have fluctuating hormone levels. They are not adults, even though they may seem really mature because their brains simply only mature around the age of 25. Today, we measure that 9% of teen deaths are caused by suicide, and that it is the fastest growing cause of death in this age group. This age group. They have hardly tasted life between the ages of 15 and 24, and yet they don't see their way ahead. We can prevent that. And then the classic example, those very privileged 
couples who say to me, oh, my parents celebrated 65 years of marriage, we are solid. And then one day I get a phone call and the tears are flowing and something did happen, something went wrong because in the armor of that couple, they, they had space to grow and they were not necessarily aware that there are, are areas that they still needed to grow. And then uh, temptation set in and the story didn't end well. Now in South Africa, the average divorce is filed within the first five to eight years of marriage. So I often sit with parents who have really small children uh, below the age of five who are now looking for co-parenting counseling. It's not necessary, it can be prevented. And if you think ahead of your own child who will be married one day, you can also prevent that they run into the same problems that every other couple runs into and then that they are not necessarily carrying the right weapons to fight for, fight against the destruction of those problems. I believe that prevention is in the hands of parents. So here we look at one or two ways uh, that parent leaders can actually prepare their teens for the future. I'm sure that you are aware that there is a gap between school and work environment. There is a gap between what kids think they can do and what really happens out there in the real world. There's a gap between what they imagine work to be and the daily grind of that particular career. And we are the ones who need to reach their hearts and their imagination in such a way that we can help them to understand where they really fit in, into which working environment do they really fit in, in terms of their particular makeup. Not just the career that they would like to have, not just the career that fits their, their talents, not just the career that will, will bring them the salary that they are dreaming of, because they will not necessarily be happy or productive and fruitful or content they need, we need to look at their own specific, specific unique makeup to see where they will fit in. And then I say walk the talk because did I do this? Yes. What I'm showing you on this specific uh, slide, I did. And the next slide I'll show you, I also did that. And then in grade 11, as I always warn parents, many kids do, she pivoted completely with her direction and her aim in terms of her study field man and I had to start doing everything from scratch and start re refocusing my mind and help her to, to, to get the information about, about the pivot. And this is typically what you need to do. You need to sit with your child and you need to actually show them, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to make a real effort over a couple of years, maybe over a period of two years. Now and again, sit down and work on this project with your child. This will enable them in an enormous way because you'll be able to get into their mind about how they really think about this career that they want. Or especially for those kids who say to you, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to be. I know that for a parent that can be the most disheartening thing to hear, but it happens. And it's happening all too often. One of the things that you can do is Google together, look for questions to ask people. <clears throat> if you are able to arrange appointments for them to talk to people who are in the job field that, you'll, that your teen is, is, is interested in, visit the open days. We did the open days, but we also got personal appointments wherever I could so that we could actually sit comfortably and speak to a representative of the institution and really talk to them about not only the studies, but what happens after the studies? How does my child get employment in this field that she's interested in? And can you show me in your institution examples of people who have had uh, have been employed after they studied with you and specifically in this direction? 
And that, that I must tell you, was, was uh, an eye-opener for us. On YouTube, you can search for a day in the life of and then look for the specific career that your, that your teenager is interested in. And then I, this is a very important um, part of the journey. You have to, as a parent, remember that that B in the bridge, balance. How many parents have hobbies? How many of you here today have hobbies? Do kids have hobbies or are they just gaming? What is your child interested in besides school? What is your child interested in besides friends and besides anything that has to do with technology? Is there anything else? And can you develop or help them develop hobbies that, that will be creatively stimulating them? Because if you look at their talents, somewhere in there, there could be a, a guide towards other hobbies that they could be interested in. And the reason for this is, the entrepreneurship that it cultivates unknowingly with a child. The reason is in future, when we look at industry 4.0, yeah, we do get a little rattled about the fact that children go out of matric, study in a specific direction and base all of their future on a specific type of education. If any of you think back of the past few months and you listened to the news, did you see how many people were retrenched, had high positions or even ownership of companies where they could not, as a result of the extreme effects of COVID-19, could not proceed with their career goal specifically as they have put it together it's been sad to see this and did they have something to fall back on could they actually within a matter of three to six months pivot into something else was there anything that they could use or utilize from their hobbies or from a side skill that they could earn an income with however small, something that would positively help them grow into a side direction while they were trying to recover their mainframe. This is extremely important. And every child has talents and every child can develop a hobby, even if it is gaming, because there's a whole industry for that. And how I help parents uh, with this is um, we use a TTLP. It's called a teen a tall trees teen leadership profile and we show that we we help a, a, a teenager and parents to see if the environment of the dream career will actually suit this child's temperament and three of the main things that we look at there is the pace the pace of the temperament i for instance am a fast paced person and um, my daughter is completely the opposite to me we look at the goals, and that is a, a, quite an in-depth survey that we do. And then we look at the introversion and the extroversion. I'd like you to please, if you can, uh, enter uh, your reply in the chat box. And when we look at this, I'd like everyone to please answer in the chat box. If you could start over as a parent, what? Which one of those would you choose? What would your answer be? Gracious, can you see the chat box? Because I can't. Okay. So all you need to do is answer if you could start over as a parent. I know that isn't possible, but sometimes we wish it were. Would you raise your kids the way your parents did or would you use a modern guide? Where would you find a modern guide? One of the things that I help parents with, especially to mirror their parenting to themselves, and it has been an amazing tool for me to see how I parent, and then I could adapt some of my strategies and some of my style, uh, is to look at 
our strengths as a parent. We use the Tall Trees Parent Profile, which is a simple 15 minute quiz. And it kicks out a unique parenting profile for you as an individual parent. And it shows you how you discipline, how you nurture, and how you mentor your children. And it includes a growth plan. And here at the bottom, you can see the interesting um, metaphors that we use, the palm tree, the boxwood tree, the rose bush, and the pine tree. And that in the end gives you a whole lot of different combinations about your parenting style. And then on the right side, we have those alternatives. You know, I'm one of those. Some of us just don't want to fit into any specifics. And we have the contra boxwood, the contra rose, the contra palm, and the contra pine. And this is all very interesting, but in the end, what works best and what is most interesting is your specific parenting profile. The parenting profile. I'm sorry. Gracious, you can just stop me if I need to hear anybody there. The parenting profile gives you an overview. It's a 26 page report with a coaching session and with a growth plan. But the simple overview is what helped me kick off a whole new journey with my own child. I could see exactly how I nurture. I could see exactly how I mentor her and exactly how I discipline her. And I could see not only how it is, but how it works and what doesn't work. So I could re-strategize my parenting so that I could reach my child's heart much more effectively. And it's not easy reaching a teenager's heart. They don't necessarily share with us what they share with their peer group. And I love what Hetty Britt says, um, leadership is the ability to know when to bow, when to stand tall, and when to dance with others. And if you think about it, that's what it starts in the family. It's a family relationship. When do I submit? When do I take leadership? Even as a, as a, a child in the family, when do I speak up? When do I express myself? And then when do I dance with others? The next thing that the Tall Trees Parenting Profile does for, for parents is it, let me just take this away. It helps us to create partnerships in parenting. Parents often differ in terms of their discipline. They differ in terms of how they mentor. And they differ definitely in terms of how they nurture. If we are emotional or unemotional, we don't have to change. We simply have to understand how to support each other in the parenting process. We need to know what is the glue in us that can specifically uh, bond this family even stronger together. We need to know what drains us and what recharges us. And a profile definitely helps with that. I wanted to know what I was growing in my child's heart. So I, this is what I've called it. Am I growing weeds or seeds? because the weeds will come up and they will bite me. So we have in, in the workshops that we do with parents, something called an appreciation tree. And this is, the, this is what we use so that the family bond can actually grow and respect can grow. We, we want to move away from judging. We don't always realize that we judge each other, but we are so different and that's why it happens. We are different as people, we are unique. We want to know more, but if we know, we don't necessarily appreciate. We actually know that we are different and it can frustrate us even more because we can say to each other, I know you never listen. Or we can say, I know that you are always in a hurry, but that doesn't help us appreciate. What helps us appreciate? Understanding. And from understanding, we need to grow respect. But the respect can again not take us all the way through. It can be eroded. So we need to learn how to accept and say, I will stop trying to expect you to be like me. And this goes for parents, between parents, 
and children to, towards the parents and parents towards the children. And eventually we get to this appreciation. And we have a growth path in the parent profile that shows you how to get there and in the parent workshops. Then the pulse of my heart, the Generation Z dilemma, who am I? Where do I fit in? This is sometimes where we find our teenagers. We try to talk to them, but they are just standing right in front of us and yet their hearts are hidden. Their hearts are hidden and they smile, they obey, but we don't really get to what is bothering them. A week ago, I read about this 12 year old boy who had shot himself. Uh, it wasn't five days later and I read about the 19 year old student at University of Pretoria who shot himself. A first year student, where did his hope go for life? The parents cannot possibly be judged, but they don't have the answer. They don't know why their child did this. Why? Why did they not find or see what was going on in the child's heart? Why did the child not share with the parent the true depths of emotion in their hearts? Ultimately, we just believe that no one will understand. We really get to that point of complete deception where we believe that there's no hope. And we want to avoid that. I love empowering parents so that they can actually avoid that dilemma. And it is avoidable. Kids have stuff, parents have stuff. We all have stuff. And when a teenager does their teen leadership profile or an identity workshop, they can see their true potential and they do really find answers to their stuff. This is a short example, almost like the parenting front page, the parent style front page. This is a, a teen profile, again, a 26 page report with a growth plan and coaching. And why this is such an eye opener for a teenager is because they do want to know who they are. They do want to know where they fit in. And they, they get drained by trying to fit into with people that just don't understand them or that act in ways that they don't necessarily feel comfortable with, but they want to be part of a group, but they don't understand how, why they stand out or why they are different. So what happens to a, a teenager in terms of their awareness and their eye opener and their vision for their own future is they can see where they fit in when they do a profile because we start with teaching them how they study and this is how they work. So whether it's at home or at school or anywhere where they actually need to function alone or in a group, we show them how their functioning works, their uniqueness. And then in their social profile, we show them how they speak, they, how they fight, socialize, communicate, what their specific style is and where they can change it a bit or tweak it a bit or grow in terms of their communication being too quiet or maybe too talkative or maybe a little bit sharp on the edges and then lastly in terms of the life view profile we show a teenager how they think approach life and how they stress and how they approach success one child will overthink the other child will be a little bit too blasé about life. They need to see how that works inside of them and how to grow themselves so that they can fit in to this beautiful life that God has given them. One of the tools in the workshop that we use is this FOSS model that I created. It's about failure, obstacles, solutions, and success. And if you don't have the above two as ingredients, you don't get to the bottom two. And now as parents in life, we know this already. We have realized that life is made up of failures and obstacles. And if you don't know how to navigate your failures, think of kids now this year, how are they emotionally processing what is happening with the school year? They could feel that they are failing. How are they processing it? Do they have tools inside? to process with? How are they dealing with the obstacles? 
if they have to think of their future and think of anything that's standing in their way, how are they dealing with that? Do they give up? Do they fight? Or do they learn how to negotiate? And eventually we want them to find solutions and, and, and be successful. So that's the different, um, the different ingredients for what I call the recipe for winners. There's a book that I love to promote, uh, written by Hetty Britt, called Growing Kids with Character. And this is for parents of, with kids of any age. And if it, it, the bottom line of, of growth is character. So these, these are, this is the ladder that we, that we use to work with. We start with your thinking, how it works in your profile, you as a person, you as a parent. We look at how your decisions are made because it comes from here, comes from thoughts. And some of those decisions we make, we're not aware of actively and cognitively. But from decisions, our actions flow. And sometimes they flow before we even realize. And from that, habits are created. And some of those habits we need to break. But how can you do that if you don't look back and see where it comes from? And in the end, it results in our character. Now, if you think of anyone that you work with or, if, or your, your broader family, and you think of their reputation, this is what it is character and character is never complete it's always able to grow and mature and it's it's better to know who you are as a teenager as an adult or as a parent in terms of your parenting style so that you can eventually also grow the character of your own parenting i am really blessed by Yaku who gave us this amazing testimony on the left. I know this is a lot to read on a busy slide, but just to point out to you, he mentioned uh, children who grow up without fathers and lack identity and how brilliant this program can help them with that. And the investment that a parent workshop is uh, also for adults in terms of a business and a better workforce. And then on this side, um, this was one of my exciting events that I saw unfold in terms of an introvert son and his parents, who Peter, he as a 16 year old was also full of hormones and full of emotion, but as an introvert, he was so quiet and his parents wanted to reach his heart. And his sister being an extrovert, I, I would just say she, she ran all the energy. She managed the energy in the house. And Peter withdrew. He wasn't necessarily unhappy, but he wasn't sharing enough with his parents for them to feel that they are aligned and growing together in terms of his future and where he's going. And he did have anxiety. After we did the TTLP uh, workshops, he performed better at school. He had less anxiety. And then he also joined our intro speaker course. And he had the confidence to do speeches in class and interact better with teachers and with girls. <clears throat> that might, may not be your specific uh, ideal at this moment for your teenager, but eventually that also helps. At this point, I would just like to let you know that there is a boot camp for parents of teenagers, and I call it Gen X and Gen Z connecting hearts, because eventually that's that's what happens. That is the outcome, and that's the outcome that we all want. And I have a specific separate workshop for single parents, and if you know that you're suffering from single parents stress, then we can do something about that and look at your parenting style <clears throat> and also show you the tools on how to adapt. One of just one thing I'd like to single out is we work with false mindsets. And when we do that, they fall away and a lot of guilt falls away. And sometimes these things that you see here are barriers between a parent and a child not cognitively, but simply because 
they become part of the emotional vibes and the language emotionally that is unseen but is being communicated. These are just some of the other workshops that I present and that I can help people with in terms of building community, building relationship, and building our future. Thank you, Gracious. Lastly, I would just like to share with you that uh, I always allow my first session in a boot camp or a range of workshops to be free because I so passionately believe in the value that a parent or a teenager will receive. This is the way I structure it. And there are four sessions, that's the way we run. We really go in depth and I only take eight couples maximum in a group. The first session is always free with no obligation. And by the time you do the second session, you will receive your link and you will be able to, to um, garner your own parenting style profile from that. And with that, uh, this information, I'm going to hand over back to Gracious right now. And then I'd love to answer any of the questions that you have later in our time together. Wow, that was loaded. Uh, I, I'm failing to pick even one thing because you you bombarded us with a lot of information in terms of raising children, raising our teens. I think what captured my heart, those gaps, that's one thing that I am busy thinking, how am I going to bridge the gaps from there, what's in their mind and what's their talent and what's actually happening. Thank you so much, Karin. And as, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you have any questions, please just drop in the chat box. Then we will have a brief time to answer questions if you have. And I'm sure if you manage to take a photo so that if you want to engage with her further, you can do so. Now, moving on uh, in the interest of our time, I would love to introduce another dear friend of mine, uh, a colleague, a co-worker. Wow, we've been, yeah, through a lot together and I'm so thankful to have. And uh, Patty Boggett, originally from the US, but they have lived in Africa. Trust me, they know uh, a little bit about our culture and all. And she has been serving her, she and her husband have been serving with family life. And I will not say much, but I will give her the time to introduce her family and what she does. Over to you, Patty. Thanks, Gracious. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I am Patty Borgert and Ken and I work with Family Life, which is one of the ministries within Campus Crusade. And it's just, we deal with all sorts of aspects of family, primarily with marriage. Ken and I have been married for 35 years and 34 of those years, I can say that we've been involved with couples and uh, more intensely with the family life ministry in the last 16 or 17 years at least. We have four children, um, Nathaniel and Natalie. Nathaniel passed away just over four years ago. And Natalie is still living with us here in Pretoria. She's 24 and she's starting her second term now of her honors in psychology uh, and missing the classroom setting, but she's doing extremely well in her study. So we're very proud of her. A few years ago, we had a group of parents together for training and one of the men in the group was a veterinarian and he threw out a question. He said, I just want to know, what makes us as humans different from animal parents? And we all had a good laugh because it was kind of funny. But really, when you think about it, what does make us different as parents? Uh, because really, animal kingdom, the majority of them, they take good care of their kids, they feed them, they protect them from danger. And is that all we're meant to do as parents? 
So it led us into a discussion really about our purpose of parenting. Why are we parenting, especially as Christians? Those of us who know the Lord, we have a different purpose. And Psalm 127 is uh, my next slide, please, is um, one of the verses that is often quoted talking about children. It says, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. So we need to see our children as the arrows that we are shooting into the next generation, a generation that we may not see or may not see much of, and certainly one that we won't have that much impact in, except through the lives of our children. And so we want to think about how we can parent them to achieve the maximum benefit in the next generation, hopefully for multiple generations. And to do that, we need to be very intentional with our parenting. We can't just let them grow up in our home and take care of their physical uh, and educational, maybe emotional needs. So what does intentional parenting look like? To be intentionally in a relationship with our children. And I'm not talking about being their best friend or creating a child-centered home. I'm talking about a relationship one that is trust, it's heart-to-heart -heart communication, and a relationship there that is built on time, because our children need a lot of time, and hopefully that time is spent creating memories, creating fun times, not just being in the same house together, but it's doing things together, it's time. And it's also listening a lot of listening for our kids from the time they're infant until I'm still listening to Natalie at 24 years of age. And what that listening does is it validates them. It tells them you're important. And there's so many times because both of our kids are talkers that we would, you know, you, you have so many things that you need to be doing. And so it was hard to really put those things aside at least for a period and listen to them. But an event happened to me that just helped me to realize that listening also opens so many doors for us to just put a little nugget in their lives of truth or ask them something. When our kids were in their teens, uh, Natalie was probably a young teen, they went to different schools and the schools were far from our house. So I spent a lot of time driving and the Nathaniel School actually did have a bus that came close to our house. And we talked about the possibilities of him riding the bus. And in the end, we just said no, that I would go ahead and drive them. But it was a lot of driving. And I began to resent the amount of time, morning and afternoon, and especially afternoons, because I would often end up waiting for at least one of them. So... But one morning I had dropped Natalie at her school and it was about a 20 minute drive from her school to Nathaniel's. And as we were driving along, and I think I wasn't paying a lot of attention to what he was talking about, but all of a sudden he said, you know, my best friend, and he mentioned his best friend's uh, girlfriend is considering an abortion. And all of a sudden, I refocused everything that I was thinking about my day and what I was going to be doing. And it was like, this kid had my attention. Now, I tried to keep my eyes on the road, not look at him and just hold on to the steering wheel and listen while he was talking to me. And we only had a few minutes then from that time until we got to his school. But there were opportunities there for me to just ask him a few questions and maybe throw in some ideas and it totally changed my approach to the amount of time that I was spending with my children because I realized it's such a special time and it's such a short time in reality that we have with our kids and the time that you have in a car with them for most moms or parents it's a lot of time that we have and it can be focused time and I think what happens is when we're driving 
it's almost like we've got parallel. We're not sitting face to face looking at each other, but we're together, but we're kind of paralleling each other. And it's a safer environment for kids to bring up topics. I mean, even with Natalie, there were times that she and I would have some deep discussions and they were usually short because it was just from one place to the next, but some very interesting conversations. So we need to learn to listen. And in the process, it gives us, it opens doors for us to see their heart, to see what's important to them, to see what they're hurting with. So many things that if we'll stop lecturing, just close our mouth, learn how that we can listen to them and get into their world. Uh, the next slide, we want to be intentional with training. Now, training is a process. It's going to be over really the whole time that they're in your home, probably. And you need to begin with an end in mind. And I would suggest you start with a baby. Start with them with an infant, or if you want to be really proactive when you're pregnant. Sit and think through. If you've got a spouse, if you're not a single parent, that you can sit and make a list if you're gonna be shooting this arrow into the next generation, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to learn? What values do you want them to adopt? And you write all those things down. Don't just have them floating around in your head. Have them written down. And then look at them and think, okay, what age can we start to train this? What age can we deal with this? And so you have a plan and then sit and follow through on your plan. Be very proactive with your training. Okay, so how do we train? The first thing is you let them know what is expected. And I don't know about you, but I think sometimes as parents, we kind of assume that our children are programmed when they come to us with knowing how to do the things that we want them to do. And then we get angry when they don't do it right or they don't do it the way we want it done. And if you can parallel that to your own job and what it would be like to have a boss that asks you to do something you've never seen, you don't know how to do it, and maybe you scramble and you go to YouTube or you go to your colleagues or some expert to try and figure out how you're supposed to do this thing that he's told you to do. And then you do your best and he comes along and he scolds you or he embarrasses you, he humiliates you in front of people because you didn't do it right. You would begin to resent that boss. And we don't want our children to grow up resenting us. So we need to let them know what is expected. And number two, we need to demonstrate to them what it looks like. We need to show them how to do it. And one of the best examples was um, that uh, the founder of Family Life likes to tell the story. They have five kids. And when they were teens, they all had a job description or they, they would take turns at different jobs around the house. And one of them was to clean the kitchen. And he said he would get frustrated when he would walk in. The kids said, oh yeah, we cleaned the kitchen. And then he would walk in, he would look at the kitchen and he was so disgusted. And so he was getting angrier and angrier about the condition of the kitchen and the way the kids really weren't cleaning it well. And one day he said he was so frustrated, he picked up a box of tissues and he threw it across the room. He walked out of the room. And he said immediately he was convicted. He knew it wasn't the right response. So he went back in, he asked forgiveness of the child. But then what he did was he cleaned the kitchen. He showed them how to do it. Then he took a photo and he taped the photo up on the cupboard for the children. So they knew how to do it, and they knew what the standard was that he expected. And so when they had the kitchen clean so that it looked like the photo of what their dad had done, they knew they had cleaned the kitchen. So we need to be able to give them the demonstration, the examples. Then we need to cheer them when they're successful. I like Greg and Karen mentioned this earlier. We need to be cheerleaders of our kids when they do something well or when they've really worked hard to try and do it well, even if they didn't do it the best, we don't scold them and say, oh, well, you need it. You maybe say, okay, that is so good. You did such a good job or I know how hard you tried. It's important for us to reinforce their behavior when they do things the way we ask. Then have few rules. Don't have a lot of rules and make sure they're very clear for the kids. 
And then the next one, the next slide, is we want to have first time obedience. Now it's important that we train our kids to first time obedience, but if your home is like many homes around and the home I grew up in, mom or dad tells their children, they call them where they say, look, I want you to do such and such. The child might even respond and say, okay, mom. And then what do they do? They carry on playing, they carry on on their computer, they carry on with their cell phone and they ignore you and they go on and then you call them again. And what do they do? Okay, mom. And then they carry on and they ignore you. Now the next time, the third time, maybe your voice is getting a little bit stronger, a little bit harsher, and they still carry on because they know you're not serious yet. And it's when you finally maybe threaten or they hear the tone of your voice, oh, this time, now I know. <laughs> My mom be means business now, and if I don't go to her now, then she's, I'm going to have a punishment of some kind. At that point, usually the parent is angry. So we have trained our child that they don't have to respond to us until they know that we're angry. And I do believe that this is the point where a lot of parents either get very verbally abusive, attacking their child, calling them names, saying things to them that hurt their integrity, who they are as a person, or they may even get physically abusive, but it's their fault. They blame it on the child. Oh, the child made me angry. When in reality, what they have done is they have trained that child not to obey them the first time. What's with counting to 10? Parents will say, I'm gonna count to 10. If you expect them to do it at number 10, you train them. They do it at number one. They don't wait until 10. And you can start with a very young child. You can start with a two-year-old. They're playing games. You tell them, now, I'm, we're gonna have a training session now. When mommy calls you, you need to come the first time. And you may go to where they are playing and you take them by the hand and you say, mommy has just called you. This is what I want you to do. You take their hand, you walk over to where you were seated and you say, I want you to come and I want to see you to say, yes, mom. Then you let them go back to play and then you try it out and you call them, you call their name and you see if they come. If they come, you cheerlead and you say, wow, well done. You let them go back and you do it again. And you do this over a period of days. If they don't do it, if they don't come when you call them the first time, you go over, you take their hand and you bring them over. You say, now mommy called you. This is what I told you I wanted you to do. And then you have them look in your eyes. Are you, do you want, do you understand what I'm asking you? Okay, you can go back and play now. And you do it again. So you train them and you teach them that you come the first time mom calls. You come when the first time mom tells you you want to do it. Now, to be fair, if they're in the midst of playing, you might say, I'm going to give you a minute to pack up your toys. Or I want you just right now to pack your toys and then I want you to come. If they're finishing a project on the computer, you can say, I'm going to give you five minutes and then you better come. But they come. You don't have to call them again. They just come. And one of the reasons, you know, sometimes kids will say, oh, mom, I didn't really hear your voice. But you can train them to listen for your voice. Because sometimes they kind of tune you out, even though they really do hear you. And one of the reasons it's so important for us to be training is not only in our own homes for us to have peace and harmony and not all this angst and anger from parents, but we want them to learn to listen to God, to hear God's voice the first time he tells them something. And we are in training them. Remember, we're shooting them out as arrows. So we want to train them that when they hear God's voice the first time, then they are obedient to him. The next point is to be intentional to make your home a safe place. And by this, I'm not talking about physical safety. That's the given. What I'm talking about here is a, a safe place for your kids that they want to be with you, 
the world out there does badger them. It, it, they bully, they're bullied, they're demeaned because they can't do, they can't play sports as well as the next person. And they come home, their shoulders are slumping. They want their home to be a safe place. They don't want more of the same thing once they get home. They want to know that their parents love them, their parents accept them. Kareem talked about failures. It's part of growing. Sometimes they come home and they failed miserably at something. They don't want a parent who says, well, you know, you just didn't try enough. They want a parent that says, that's okay. You can do better. How can we make this better the next time? Do you, can you think about it? What could you do? Teach them how to process their failures so that they turn those failures into stepping stones and ways to grow. And, and you build that trust that they know my home is a place where I am going to be loved. My parents may not like my behavior. My parents may not like my life choices once they get older, but they know the parent still loves them and still accepts them for who they are. So your children then when they've grown and they've left home, they want to come back because they want to spend time with the people that they know really care about them and even if they've failed, are gonna be there just to support them. My next slide is to be intentional to give your children all the help need to, sorry, all the help they need to embrace moral purity. Moral purity is so much more than just abstaining from sex. But for today, I'm, I'm going to deal more about sexual purity. And what we need to do with our children is not just to say, don't do it. It's not good enough. The pressure of the world now, it's so much more than even what any of us grew up with. It's normal to be morally impure. And so our children need to know why. We need to teach them not just the whys and not because, oh, just because the Bible says so, but we need to lift moral purity up to its proper place. This is a, a noble thing. It's an honorable thing. It's something that's, that has lots of rewards to it. So you want to paint a picture of moral purity that is lofty and really has God's view of it, not just I'm spoiling, your fun is being spoiled, which is what the world will try and tell you, oh, you know, but there are reasons why. And if you need help to come up with those reasons for your children to build that picture of the, the wonderful side of being morally pure, then you can go to our website, many website, Christian websites can give you resources that help you just in that area of building up the idea, this is something really to strive for, that we want to be morally pure. So your kids adopt it as their value, not just mom and dad's value, that this is what they're telling me. And I have to say this, that there may be some of you watching this that failed in your own life, but I think it's not a reason to be uh, ashamed or to say, well, I can't then train in my own children. God has so much grace. He has so much forgiveness and shame isn't something he does with his kids. So it's still important for us to be out there and lifting it up as the standard for our own kids. And you can do it with your head held high and just know that, that you're doing it because you're thinking about them and their future and what kind of child you're gonna launch into the next generation. You need to start when they're young Start with age-appropriate answers to their questions, but be more proactive than that. Ken and I had the, the benefit of a set of books that Focus on the Family put out at that time, but I don't think it's in print anymore. But they had little booklets that were for the first kind of three major categories, I think starting with a five-year-old. They just had a lot of pictures in it, very little text just begin to introduce the idea of sex. And then as they went a step farther, you could read the book to them again. And by the time they got to teenagers, then they had their own book. And then there was an accompanying book with it for parents, just to help 
them guide their children through the different stages of how to answer those questions. And please use correct terminology when you're talking about body parts. We don't need to use euphemisms and funny things, expressions, because what happens is that tells our child when they begin to realize what's going on that there's something dirty or there's something wrong about this that we can't use proper names for things. So use the proper name. They may be the only child in school who knows proper names, who knows. When they're school age, we want to give them terminology so that they can articulate why they don't participate in some activities with the other kids in school. So we want to help them with that. And then I have to say that when they are around 11 or 12, we want to be even more proactive to prepare them for the changes, the emotional changes, all the hormones that are going on, the things that are, their body changes. We want to proactively talk to them about that so we prepare them. And what we like to say is we minimize the surprises for them. They're still gonna be surprised. They're still gonna be upset. They're still gonna be angry with many of the changes that take place in their life, but we want to minimize those. So when our child, let's go on to the next slide. When our children each turned 12, we took them away for a weekend away. And we were fortunate enough, we had the tool then of this passport to purity. And it allowed us to take our children away for a Friday afternoon, Saturday, and talk to them about specific areas that they could be expecting in the next couple of years. And the, the set has this kit, has a DVD, DVDs, plural, that the Dennis and Barbara Rainey address the children, whether it's a, a, a boy or a girl, and then there's specific ones for the girl, specific ones for the boy, that talk about different areas of change in their life, but also how to handle them when they come, how to relate to the opposite sex, so many things like that. And then there's like a worksheet that the parents can go on and they can talk with their child about the things that were in the DVD. And then there's, you will see in the picture there, there's all kinds of extra little things that are added in because you do projects with them that help explain what they are learning in these DVDs. And even if you don't have the kit, you can still do the same thing. It just is a little bit more work if you don't have a kit. We have these available in our office. And you can still, but you, the idea is you need to be proactive. You need to let the children know, not just stumble into teenager section of life, portion of life, and then come across all the different changes that are gonna be taking uh, or, or experiencing. And if we are not telling our children the truth and how to approach this, the world is going to be telling them half-truths and they're going to have a distorted view of sex. My next slide maybe should have been my first one. It's that we need to intentionally pray. There is no way we can really launch kids into the next generation that we shoot our arrows without leaning into the power that God gives us as parents to do it. You know, I studied, my degree was a family degree, and I studied child development and psychology, different aspects of it, and I knew a lot about children and people, people building, not child raising, but people building. Ken and I had attended some seminars, we had read some books together, so we thought we had this parenting thing down. Well, I tell you what, it was such a humbling experience. When children came into our home and we started being faced with things, we didn't know a clue. We, there were principles, there were biblical principles, but sometimes we didn't know how to apply them. And, and we got down on our knees before the Lord, just crying out to him, you've got to help us through this. And of course, if you don't have compliant children, it's it makes even much more of a challenge. Although the non-compliant child often in the end makes a better leader because they're also prepared to stand up against their peers 
and to be strong when they're dealing with their peers the same way that they are with us as parents. In conclusion, I just want to tell a very, very short story. There was a man that saw three men working with mortar and bricks. And he went to the first man and he said, what are you doing? And the man said, I'm laying bricks. So he went to the second man and he asked him the same question. And that man said, I'm building a wall. Then he went to the third and the final brick layer. And that man said, I'm building a cathedral. And I think as parents, sometimes the day to day of building people, of raising these children in our home, we may feel like we're just laying bricks. But if we keep our eyes on the goal that we're actually building cathedrals, we're building people that we're gonna shoot into the next generation to make a godly impact there, then it helps us keep our focus and maintain the stamina that it needs. Because a lot of times parenting is just very tiring. It's very exhausting. But God will give you the strength and the stamina to get through it. If we can go to our last slide, I just want to show the websites that give you lots of resources, tons of resources on marriage, on family, on parenting, on step parenting, step family. There's a whole, we have a, a man who, who has spent 25, 30 years dealing with step families and he's written a lot of books. His name is Ron Beal. And there's a lot of resources on these websites from him as well. So the first website is the South African website. Um, it's the familylife.org.za. And we have resources there, and we also post when we're running courses, uh, seminars, different things like that. And just this month, we've also started once a week. We are having a two-minute podcast that we're posting on our website that deals with some aspect of marriage and relationships. And that's real fun, been challenging for us to get it into two minutes, but that's been good. Then on the familylife.com, it's our parent organization in the States, um, and their website is massive. It has just about every topic in the world that you would have um, on parenting because they have a daily radio program, and they have transcripts and podcasts of every single radio program they've had for the last 20 or 30 years. And they've interviewed top authors, speakers, everything related to family. So there's just tons of resources on both of those for any questions that you might have. All right, Gracious, I'm going to give it back over to you. Thank you. Wow, that's another amazing hand. I don't even know what to sum up, but allow me to just pick out one of the things that I love what you said intentionally pray because we are raising the next generation and as parents it's upon us we are not just i know at one point if i'm to be very vulnerable i just wanted my kids to to grow you know it's like let them do the diaper training let them learn how to eat themselves because i'm tired it's physically draining but i've learned that I am responsible, and you as a parent here, you are responsible to raise the next generation. I'm so thankful to our panelists. Thank you so much for putting in the hard work, the research. I, I really appreciate the effort. And to um, us as participants, I hope we have learned something, we have benefited, and we are ready to take this journey further as we raise the next generation generation. I am doing my part. I will do my best. I will pray. I will research. I will study. I will ask other parents and I will trust the Lord. As I mentioned from the beginning, we want to raise a generation of kids, of leaders who fear nothing but God. So thank you so, so much. The sex talk. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's one of those, hey, uh, but I have to do, I have to, to, to do, and the Lord has blessed me with four of them. The grace is sufficient. I would also love to say, please bear with us. We are really running very late. Please uh, accept my apology. We have two questions that I would just love to throw to the panelists. 
the first one will go to Karin. Karin, someone mentioned uh, our one of our participants asked that her daughter struggles with mood swings. She is just 11 years. How can she deal with that? Um, then uh, Patty, when Karin has done, please would you also help this participant? She said that, how do I deal with a teen who doesn't want to be my baby anymore? She wants to be independent and it breaks her heart as a mom. So briefly, can you just answer those two questions? Thank you, Gracious. Yes, I saw that question and uh, the truth is one of my slides that I actually deleted from today's overview is a, is a photograph of a very high mountain. And on this mountain slope, as it goes up, you see one person against this flat wall. And I use that to show that uh, the parent who was happily raising his little kids or the, the parent couple are now entering the teenage phase. And when does that happen? It happens between the age of 11 and 12. And that is the perfect time to start seeing quite a few differences in your child. And you might have been used to a certain temperament and now you see those, those mood swings starting. That is when the hormones are really starting and we need to use the year between the age of 11 and 12 to empower ourselves for the teenage years. Because as Patty also said, every parent gets the wake up call. And once they are 16, you realize that you're still trying to grapple with what on earth has happened to your child. Uh, it starts between the age of 11 and 12. And those temperament uh, tantrums normally come from uh, a child who falls within the boxwood or the rose profile. They can then be introvert or extrovert, it doesn't matter, but it's the fluctuation of hormones and how to deal with it better is also to, is, is by understanding the interaction between yourself and your child. If you are very strong in your discipline, if you are a strong outspoken type of parent, and that child will clash with you. If you see that this is the kind of child who is now having mood swings and, and, and tantrums, because you thought it, you might have thought it happens at the age of two and three and then it's over. Well, what you see now is nothing compared to maybe what you would see at the age of 16. And the reason is they are searching for their identity and they are experiencing the tumultuous emotions inside of them that we as adults have perhaps learned to navigate and to manage. Now it's their turn. So what do we do with that? First of all, if you are a strong parent, a strong personality, you need to stand back a little bit and do what Patty says, listen much deeper. Don't listen to the words, listen to the motivation. Listen to the whining that's going on at the bottom of the tantrum, because the tantrum is just the emotion and the outburst at the top of the iceberg. And taking a break with a child like that when they are calm and reaching maybe into their heart will help a lot to see what the motivation is. And if you are a soft-hearted parent and you are quiet, you might feel overwhelmed by the fact that this child is now acting out and they could take advantage of that because they are are, are not controlling their, their feelings and that is when we need to understand what where does your parent temperament lie what are your strengths your strengths would be to listen and again to reach that heart and i, I patty very beautifully touched on the listening skill thank you gracious Oh, thank you so much. I hope our participant benefited. Now over to you, Patty, uh, the second question. All right, the second question that what do we do when our teenager no longer wants to be mom's baby anymore? You're not going to like my answer, but we don't want them to be our baby anymore. Not in truth. You see, 
we, those children are not our children. They are God's children. We are merely stewards of those children for the time they're in our home. Mm -hmm. And it is a, it, we are going to give an accounting for what kind of steward we were. And so we, our purpose is not to keep them our baby. Our purpose is to teach them how to fly. Let them grow up, let them become who they are meant to be and encourage them to do that. It is painful. It is hard because we love our children. And as much as I would love to have Natalie in my home for the rest of her life, it, it's not healthy. It's not right. It's not what we want in, in reality. We don't want our 45-year-old son or daughter still being our baby. So you want to give them wings. You have to release them. You have to let them learn how to be an adult. Uh, our founder of Family Life also gives the, the illustration. He talks about, if you can imagine, almost like a, um, we have these cords between us and the child that are like power cords. And our job as parents is to over the years, and by teenage years, you should have done most of it already, unplug that dependence on us and plug it into God so that God is the one that they are dependent on. God is their father. God is the one that is, is going to be their heart. And I'll tell you what the damage happens is if we keep our children, our babies, what's going to happen when they get married? We're going to have a very hard time. That, the scriptures are very clear. A man shall leave his mother and he shall leave his father and be joined to his wife and become one flesh. Mm -hmm. So if he's still attached to mama as her baby, there's no way he can be attached and bonded with his wife the way God intended. And Ken says he marvels all the time to think that in marriage, his relationship with me is meant to be stronger really than his relationship with his mother. So we don't want to have our babies and it is hard, but we have to let them go and, and encourage them to go, encourage them to mature, grow up and, and be God's baby instead. Hmm. Wow, well, how does it is? We are just stewards and we want to release them into the hands of the Lord for them to be independent. Um, yeah, I hope the participant benefited. So thank you so much, my panelists. Thank you so much, uh, the moderators. And thank you, our participants. I know we went over 30 minutes and I do want to apologize because of that. But thank you for sticking around. Allow me to just briefly share, just in case you are here and you really, you are passionate. I mentioned about Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, we are all about reaching out we are all about evangelizing and discipling you are here and you have a desire to do that not just to raise your own children but to disciple others we do have an amazing platform called the knowing god platform where we have training resources that you can use to reach out to people please get in touch with us so that we can train you so that we can work together either as an individual your church or an organization. I share that Campus Crusade, we are all about partnership. We Today we have the Lead, Rise, Grow, Karine with us. And yeah, that's the idea because we are all about making Jesus Christ known. And if you are here and you would love to commit your life to, to the Lord because of time, please feel free to get in touch with us as well. And we'll be happy to, to help you with what the Lord has given us. Thank you, people. Have an awesome evening until we meet again in the next webinar. Thank you so much. And to my two moderators behind the scene, thank you, guys. May the Lord bless you so much. <laughs>